Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you that I didn't get to say good morning to personally. And uh, yeah. Welcome, visitors. Welcome. Welcome, visitors watching online. Maybe you're checking us out for the first time. Maybe you're wondering what this weird church is about. You know, new, new things sometimes people view with a degree of skepticism. New things. But uh, God has always been doing new things. And doing things that people were like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> right? We see that all throughout Scripture. God doing something new and people trying to figure it out. What, what's going on? So, welcome. We hope we get to meet you in person sometime soon. But thank you for being with us online this morning or today. It's, you know how it goes. Sometimes you, you try to be funny and sometimes it works and other times you're just like, okay, let's move on. This must be a let's move on type of morning. Um, <laughs> So last week, we talked about how God is writing a bigger story. Anybody remember that? Anybody get anything out of that? God's writing a bigger story, and your life is part of that bigger story that he's writing. And that's why you can't give up. That's why you can't quit. That's why when things are hard, or persecution comes, you can't fall off, because there's... A bigger story that's being written and you're just a point in that. So today, I want us to look at how, a little more closely, how each person's part of that bigger story may look different than other people's parts <laughs> of the story, right? We love to talk about how, like, you know, even people who don't believe in God, it's like, oh, yes, you know, every, every person is an individual, right? Has a unique thumbprint, um, facial recognition software, you know, every person is unique. And as those who believe in God, we understand Oh, yeah, well, that makes perfect sense because God is a creative God and he doesn't need to make two things exactly the same. He's infinitely creative and so he can make each of us unique, right? And so your part of this bigger story that he's writing is going to be slightly different and unique from other people's parts of the story. And that's not just okay, it's good. Right? There are some things that are similar, yes, but not everything, right? Like, praise the Lord, we all have a nose. But my nose looks different than yours, or yours, or yours, right? So we all have this story. God's writing it. And this is what I really want to key in on this morning is how no matter what your part of God's story looks like in your life, God is giving you the grace to walk it out. That's where we're going this morning. If you'd like to have titles, uh, my title is Grace for Life. Grace for Life. Because that's what God offers each and every one of us if we choose to accept it. If we choose to walk in it. So, Talking about stories, and I mean, God is good. Um, I love when Holy Spirit just kind of like brings affirming words. Um, you know, Pastor Joe didn't know what I was planning to preach this morning. Um, but that story about Brian Dawkins that he shared, it's like, yeah, that, that fits. Like, he had a calling on his life. He walked it out in the grace of God. Now, some of you might be like, well, if I was a professional athlete, 
and making that kind of money, yeah, it would be easy to, well, how many people know that's a lot of work and a lot of pressure, right? And you might think that it would be fun or easy to have that, that position or that you know, mantle that he carried, but he needed God's grace to be able to honor God even in that elevated position that he had. And so the story I want to briefly tell you guys uh, this morning, I'm not going to go into like all kind of detail, but uh, in my own personal life, someone that I've seen uh, walk out their part of God's story in his grace. And that is um, my cousin, who some of you may remember um, recently her husband passed away very unexpectedly, very suddenly, and left her as a young mother with three young boys. Now, <laughs> obviously, that would be an easy place to just despair. And she, she's a believer, you know, praise the Lord. But even in that, it would be a really easy place and nobody would fault you for being like, you know, just falling apart, basically. And yet, I got to see her and her family got to see her and her friends got to see her and... So many people got to see her be a witness and a testimony to, yes, this is really hard. And yes, I hate it that this happened. But I still believe God is with me. And that he's giving me the grace to do what I need to do. That he's going to take care of us. Like if God knows what I'm dealing with. If God knows what you're dealing with, then he's also made enough grace, his grace, available to you to be able to give him glory in it. Does that make sense? And that's what I see her doing, and it's such a, a, an awesome testimony and a challenge for me to say, yeah, Lord, you know, I believe that you're with me, even though I don't like what's happening <laughs> right now. Give me grace to, to honor you, in, even in this. And so, as I looked to her and I looked to Jesus, I realized, you know, really Jesus asks each and every person to follow him into a future that's unknown. He says, I'm with you always, but he doesn't tell you what's going to happen next. And so it leaves us in this place of, of just having to trust that wherever God takes you, whatever God allows in your life, it's for a, a purpose. It's for a reason, and it's so that you can learn to live in his grace and, and give him glory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So when, when we look at, at how Jesus called some of his disciples, uh, I think it, it helps because we get to kind of see how much trust was required of them just to follow him. So, first I want to go to Mark chapter 1, and I think we have some of these, I think we have some of these on the screen for you, maybe. Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 16 through 20. Mark 1, 16 through 20. It says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. 
Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And then it just says, And they left their nets at once and followed him. You know, I mean, we read that, and it's like, well, that sounds easy. They just left everything and followed him. But like, I mean, seriously, think about that. You know, you have a, a job right now or you have, you know, whatever your, your role is in life. And, and Jesus says, you know, oh, hey, like, just put all that down and come follow me. And he doesn't follow up with, you know, and this is how much, you know, I'll make sure you make and uh, I'm going to need you this many days a week uh, for this many hours and these will be your responsibilities, um, you know, and I'll follow up with you. Like, it's just, come follow me. <laughs> and they had to trust that there was something for them that they would be taken care of, right? And then it says, a little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Like, I mean, are you guys, are you guys feeling that? Like, if that was you right now, and Jesus physically walked by and was like, hey, I need you right now. Drop everything. We're going somewhere. <laughs> Would you really honestly be able to be like, yep, I'm there, Lord. <laughs> and here's the thing. Even beyond that, Jesus, he doesn't, later on, he doesn't even pull any punches in telling people what are some of the things that you might expect as his follower. Like, hey, come follow me. But just so you know, these are some things that you might expect, that you, that you might experience. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, <laughs> Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Well, what's the first selfish way that you could not follow Jesus in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, I said that really weird. Um, <laughs> basically, the root of that is if you would prefer to choose your own future and your own way of doing things, then don't, he's like, not don't even bother, but like, if you really want to follow me, you have to trust that I'm going to take you <laughs> where you need to go. It's not going to be up to you anymore. And that's a scary, that can be a scary place to be, right? He even goes so far as to say, at, when, he's, when Jesus is explaining to people what could, what could be expected, in Matthew 8, Verses 19 through 20, Jesus is speaking to the crowd, as he often did. And it says, One of the teachers of religious law said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. So he's, he's very clear about, you know, listen, even I don't have, like, 
a place that's mine. Like, I go where the Father sends me. I don't know that I would choose that. <laughs> you know, I like some level of, you know, this is mine and this is what I do, right? I like to know what's coming, <laughs> what to expect. <laughs> but this is the point. The point is that whatever it is that God has asked of you, whatever it is that God has put into your hands to walk through, into your life to walk through, He's given you the grace to see it through, even though you don't know what tomorrow holds. Even though Jesus didn't promise that it's going to be easy or fun, But he did promise that his grace would be enough for you. And he did promise that he would be with you always. So you have those two things to stand on if you choose to. Paul, if you want to go to Philippians, Philippians chapter 4 or if you just want to make a note of it and, and check it out later. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul says, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, meaning I can live with little, I can live with much, I can live through hard things, I can live through good things. And in all of them, Christ is giving me strength. There's grace for life. God's giving you grace for life. Is anybody with me? Yes? All right. He's giving you that grace so that you can shine for Him through whatever circumstances He takes you through. Like Psalm says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Right? And it says, you make me lie down in green pastures. <laughs> you make me lie down. But he's with you. He's with you in the valley. He's with you at the green pasture. Okay? His grace is with you. I read this the other day and it it jumped out to me Proverbs 15:15 15, 15. Proverbs 15:15 15, 15. In the New Living Translation it says for the despondent I know that's a big word but despondent um, somebody shout out uh, who's who's my walking um, thesaurus another word for despondent Sad, despair, despairing. Okay? For the despondent, every day brings trouble. For the happy heart, life is a continual feast. And what stood out to me in the context of this idea of grace for life is how <laughs> it doesn't say when every day brings trouble, despair follows. It doesn't say when life is a continual feast, then the heart is happy. Are you seeing that? 
the attitude of your heart towards what God is giving you is what will determine whether you're able to receive his grace for that thing or not. So if it's something hard or something you don't want, like my cousin and her story, the despondent heart is crushed. But the heart that chooses joy in the midst still deals with the, the real emotions and the real day-to-day -day struggle of that reality, but yet is looking for opportunities to worship God in it and to give God praise in it. It's sort of that like we see what we're looking for kind of a thing. In the Living Bible Translation, that same verse reads like this. When a person is gloomy, everything seems to go wrong. <laughs> you know, you ever had that, like a period of time in your life? Hopefully you're not walking through your whole entire life that way. But, you know, sometimes we get in those little ruts or those funks where it's like everything is just, ugh. you know, even good things don't make you happy because you're just like, Everything is, everything is seen through this lens that you have on of negative. And so even when people are nice to you, you're mean to them, you know, or whatever. It's that kind of a thing. It says when, it, when a person is cheerful, everything seems right. When, when you choose to receive God's grace in everything in your life, you can also walk in that joy that's like, yeah, this is hard. But I choose, I choose to trust the Lord and I choose to not be despondent, right? And this is really the question that we all have to ask ourselves, whether good things are happening in your life right now and you're like Brian Dawkins and you're on top of your game and you know or if you're feeling like you're at the bottom and you can't imagine things getting any worse either place it doesn't matter the the questions that we have to ask ourselves is do i really believe that God is with me even in this broken place. Do, do I really believe that you're with me, God, when bad things happen? Do I really believe that you're giving me grace for life in the hard things of life? The other question we have to ask ourselves when things are going well is, or when something, you know, really, ah, I'm just so excited that, you know, God did this in my life. We got to be real with ourselves and be, is that the only time when we're giving him glory? Is that the only time when we have a testimony to share? Like, oh man, God is so good. This awesome thing just happened. You know, praise the Lord, but is God still good when something bad happens? Is he? Yes. Of course. <laughs> of course he is. But obviously it's easier to say that when things are going well. So that's, that's the thing that we have to wrestle with, is basically do, do we feel like, if we're honest with ourselves, do we feel like, and maybe this doesn't come out of your mouth, but do you feel like God has abandoned you when something bad happens in your life? And you don't have to answer that question right now. So, 
<laughs> I'm going to change gears a little bit. We're still talking about grace for life, but I want to relate it. I want to relate it to something earthly so that we have a, a picture. So receiving um, the free gift of salvation through Jesus, right? And living all of your life for him, all of your life and living all of your life in his grace. It's like winning one of those lottery games where it's like, uh, you know, have you, you've seen the commercials or you've, you've heard of like, uh, you know, money for life. It'll be like you get X number of dollars every week or every month for the rest of your life, right? Anybody seen those, those lottery games? Now, <laughs> of course we know that it's better, life in, with Jesus is better than just getting money, right? That I'm, not, I'm not saying it like that. Because we know that even when good things happen in your life, even when you have money, it doesn't guarantee happiness. Good things happening in your life doesn't guarantee satisfaction. It's nice, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, Money for life is, is great, but grace for life is better. Because grace for life, <laughs> grace for life means that you can endure anything and give God glory in it. You can, God is preparing you even to receive all those good things and blessings and not see it as something that you earned. Or like the story that Jesus told of, of the, the farmer or the, the manager, you know, it's my hard work has produced this and now I get to live securely, right? That's not how it works. That's not grace for life. That's you saying, I want to be in control, Jesus, and this is how it's going to go. And if I put in the hard work and I manage things right, then I should get to kick my feet up and take life easy, right? That's what he said in the story. That's what the man said. Or let me give you another example. We've all been, at least been to a wedding, right? Those of you that aren't married, you've at least been to a wedding. Kids, guys, you've at least been to a wedding. <laughs> we know the traditional part of the exchange of vows, right? Where two people commit to be faithful to each other in what? Sickness and health in good times and bad. And that's what Jesus is calling each one of you to. Is to a life of faithfulness to him in sickness and in health. <laughs> in good times and in bad to give him honor and glory and all of those things. He wants to be involved in every aspect of your life because it's his story that he's writing in you. <laughs> it's his story. Mm, amen. Now, if you feel like that's not really for you, like, okay, yeah, that's great. That's great, Pastor. I already accepted Jesus into my life. I already prayed that prayer. You know, I'm good. I'm good. I'm covered. Right? Well, technically, you're correct. You are covered. If you've given your life to Jesus and, and you meant that, you know, yes, you're covered. And praise the Lord. But you're also wrong. Because... Jesus gave everything to purchase you. He gave everything to purchase you. And he requires all of you in return. 
What did he say? If you want to follow me, you must give up your selfish ways. <laughs> There's so many times that it would be easier to stay at home. There's so many times that it would be easier to sleep than to pray. There's so many times that it would be easier to hang out with your family than to go visit someone that needs a visit. There's so many times that selfishly we could be like, <sighs> you know what, Lord? I know I said that you can have everything, but if you don't mind, I'm going to just go ahead and hold on to this because it's too hard for me to let it go. Jesus deserves all of you, everything that you have to give, <laughs> the good and the bad. He deserves it all. In fact, if you look, this is my last scripture. If you look at Mark, you can go there. Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, we get a glimpse firsthand of how Jesus felt about people who thought they were good enough. It says, Then Jesus went out to the lakeshore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. And just like we were talking about earlier, it says, Levi got up and followed him. And then later on, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. It says there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But this is what I want you to pay attention to. But when the teachers of religious law saw... Uh, I'm sorry. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with such scum? And when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And this is the key. Jesus said, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So the only thing that could possibly, possibly keep Jesus from calling you to follow him is if you think you're righteous enough already. If you think you're good enough already, <laughs> then Jesus is like, seems like you're good. You got it all figured out. You got your ways and how you want to do things. If you think you can live your life just fine on your own, if you think you're good enough just because you believe in him? Like, yeah, I believe in God. I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a, you know, I'm a religious person. Like, I, whatever. Like, yeah. No, Jesus is like, I want all of you. All of you. Every part. Every part. I want us to have an opportunity this morning to reflect. To reflect and be, be real with God and respond to the Holy Spirit. Because I believe Holy Spirit is here. Because we're here. And because Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name... I'm there. And so I want us to have that opportunity to reflect and to respond. 
And so I would encourage you, we're going to pray, but, you know, if it's been a little while and you need to stretch your legs, walk around. How many know you can walk and pray? It's okay. It's even okay if you have your eyes open so that you don't walk into something. It's okay. I heard a great quote, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, but it said, actually, I think it was Billy Graham. It's not the physical posture that is important while praying. It's the posture of your heart while you're praying. So let's pray together. Just allow Holy Spirit to speak to you, to point out in you anything um, that you've held back from him, any uh, orphan spirit that when something bad happens makes you feel like God has abandoned you. God will never abandon you in those hard times. And God won't abandon you in the good times. But you need to choose to receive His grace for life. So Father, thank You. Thank You. Thank You that You are good, God. Thank You that You love us in spite of ourselves. Thank You that You loved us even when we were your enemies, even when we were far from you, God. Before we were born, you loved us. And you sent your son. You showed your love for us by sending your son, Jesus, to live, to die. And to be raised up to new life so that we can live and honor you, so that we can even honor you in death, Lord, and so that we can live again, so that we can have hope of glory with you, God, for eternity. Thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to your people right now, this morning. That you would speak to them, Holy Spirit. That you would point out to us anything in us, Lord, that has separated us from you, that has kept us from living in the fullness of your grace. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that when you point things out to us through your Holy Spirit, that it's not to condemn us or to push us away, but it's to correct us because you correct those that you love and you draw us closer to yourself so that we can, like the song that we sang, Lord, be more like you, Jesus, as you correct us and you draw us in and we encounter you. We want to be more like you, God, more like you, Jesus. We need more of you, Holy Spirit. I ask for a fresh outpouring of you, Holy Spirit, on your people. God, as they go into their week, Lord, that they would not be selfish with their time, Lord, but that they would take time just to be with you. Lord, trusting that you will meet them there in that place, wherever they are. Because you want to give them grace for that day, grace for today, grace for whatever it is that you're bringing into their lives today, whatever it is that you're putting into their hands that day to steward and to manage that you're walking with them through it and giving them the grace to shine for you through it. So I thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Yes. If any of these specific things are you this morning in this atmosphere of prayer, if any of these things are, are you today, I want to pray with you before you leave. Not because there's anything special about me, but just because I love you and I care for you and I want to pray with you. So if any of these things are you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, for real, for real, I want to pray with you. 
if through this talk you see that you haven't opened every door to Jesus, if you haven't opened every area of your life to his lordship, then I want to pray with you. If you recognize that you've had a, a one-sided relationship with God where you're only giving him glory when good things happen, and you recognize that you want to have a healthy relationship with him where you're giving him glory in all things, then I want to pray with you. And if you've been going through it, I know, I know people are dealing with stuff. Some things I know, some things I don't. But if you've been going through it and you just need some people to stand in agreement with you, agree <laughs> that you will receive grace to walk through this and agree with you that God will be glorified in it, then let's pray together. And if there's anything else that Holy Spirit has laid on your heart this morning, then let's pray together. And if you're none of those things, then I would invite you to come and pray with anyone who needs someone to pray with. It doesn't have to be just me. Amen? So if that's you, if any of those things are you, I'm going to invite you to come up and we'll pray or find me on the way out and we'll pray. Um, and John, if you don't mind coming and um, just leading us in, in one more song, um, if you want to go back to something, that's fine. If, if you want to bring something else, that's fine. Uh, but let's just, let's just stay in, in that place and in that atmosphere of of prayer, surrender to the Lord, openness to what the Holy Spirit wants to do right now. Um, if you just got to go and you got to get somewhere, that's cool. Go in peace. We love you guys. Um, you know, try to do it in a, a quiet way, honoring the, the time. Um, but yeah, I will get out of the way. We'll, we'll sing and, and pray and let God do what only He can do. Amen? Amen.